It's here. Peloton's best offer of the season. Get up to $300 off accessories when you purchase a Peloton Tread. Choose from accessories like a heart rate monitor, non-slip grip dumbbells, yoga blocks, and more. If you've been looking for a sign to join Peloton, this offer gives you everything you need to get going. Hurry, Peloton's best offer of the season is here, but not for long. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Limited time offer cannot be combined with other offers. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. Did you know 77% of women who wear bladder weakness products experience intimate skin irritation? As if having incontinence wasn't stressful enough. But Tenna Intimate Pads have been gynecologist tested and do not cause skin irritation. Gentle on my intimate skin. I need to try Tenna Intimate Pads. Visit TennaSample.com for your free sample. Kind to skin protects like Tenna. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on a special Tuesday edition of The Yard. We're going to talk about Egg Bowl history today and talk about the history of this rivalry, some of the more notable games. And, of course, we're only going to talk about Mississippi State wins for the most part. Those are the only games that really matter because Ole Miss cheated in the others. Now, you know what I'm saying. But we're going to talk about kind of the history of the rivalry. You know, I've written a couple books about the history of this rivalry. I've learned a lot. I want to share some of that with you today. Probably some things that uh, you're unaware of. A lot of people don't understand the genesis of this rivalry. And so we're going to break some of that down. There are not a lot of um, good tidings, I guess we would say. It has always been a toxic rivalry. From the very beginning. And when I wrote uh, Stark Villains, the very first chapter is contentious from the beginning. It has always been contentious. Of course, we have these carpetbaggers that show up in the media, guys like Hugh Kellenberger and people like that, that, oh, it's never been this bad. Guys, it's always been bad. There are times it's been less bad than others, but it's always been bad. I suspect it always will be. And I think we're all really fine with that arrangement. You know, people are like, oh, you know, it's just another game. It's not just another game. It's just not. It's about, uh, you know, the old culture versus agriculture type church. You know, who do you think clothes and feeds you, idiots? But we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Have a cool top ten list today, The Rock of Mississippi. A couple of those bands are really special to me for maybe reasons you're unaware. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about um, preview and Ole Miss tomorrow. A lot of people have said, you know, Steve, you ought to do the show every day. I don't know that I could. I don't know that I have the time or the patience. But this week, rivalry week, you can get four shows. And then on Thursday, we're going to play a football game. And hopefully, we can win that football game. I can assure you, based on recent conversation, that Dr. Mark Keenum has expressed his desire to win the football game. That it has been, shall we say, adequately explained the significance <laughs> of this ballgame and what it means to Mississippi State, what it means to recruiting, not just for football or other sports, but for student recruiting. You know, your athletics are kind of an extension of the university. It's a big part of the recruiting efforts. Everybody wants to be known as, quote, the cool school. You want to win. And there are a lot of kids out there that are kind of on the fence. It makes a big difference. And we are the cool school, even though at times we don't act like it. But we should own that. So we're going to, again, kind of break it down from the beginning. I don't know how long we go, but we're going to go. I've got a lot of notes. I've got a lot of things I want to talk about. There's some things, again, that uh, I think will be both entertaining and educational today. So we'll share those with you. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company, longtime sponsors of this show. I love Bulldog Burger Company. I loved them before they loved me. But it has been a very passionate and rewarding love affair ever since. You should fall in love with Bulldog Burger Company. If you haven't already, chances are many of you have that constant craving to think, you know what, Steve, I need some spring rolls in my life. Perhaps I've lost my looks a little bit. I'm getting older. I need to have those spring rolls because they will make you better looking. Always have the spring rolls as your appetizer. I may go have them as my entree today. How about that? How would that be? Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Stark Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harper Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. 
Have that great restaurant quality hamburger. You'll be glad you did. If you're unfamiliar with the menu, let me encourage you to start with the Bulldog. That is just a great straight ahead rock and roll, good old American hamburger. And then from there, you can venture out and maybe take a walk on the wild side a bit and get that pimentology add bacon. Yeah, yeah. That'll cure what ails you right there. Maybe the mission, I get the pico de gallo on the side. You may like it on top. I don't know. To each their own. I don't judge. The Smokehouse, the Bryant, the Lauren. There's so many great options to choose from. And maybe if you're not feeling a burger but you still want to get full, get that BLT salad. I like it grilled. You may like it fried. Again, I don't judge. Either way, you're, you're a, real, a real one if you're able to finish that entire salad. I, I struggle to do it. I do. The portion's always so substantial. You always get more than your money's worth at Bulldog Burger Company. Be sure and check them out today. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right. Let's start at the beginning here. You guys may be somewhat unfamiliar with the history and and, uh, the legacy of the Battle for the Golden Egg. Now, it wasn't called the Battle for the Golden Egg until 1926. We're going to get to some of that too. That's that's part of our our journey today. We're going to to talk about how important all of that is and how it all kind of came to be. You've heard some of these stories, but maybe not quite like this. But we began playing football in 1895. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. And despite the fact that Ole Miss was just up the road from us, we didn't play for the first time until 1901. Part of that was a reluctance on Ole Miss's side to play some football. Now, they began throwing the pigskin around in 1893. So they were the first established program within the league. And it stands to reason as they're the oldest university of the major universities here in Mississippi. So they started playing before us, would not play us. And legend has it, and some media accounts at the time, is that Ole Miss simply felt that we were beneath them, didn't want to play us. And so that 1901 meeting uh, happened, finally. It's pretty crazy how it all happens in, in time. But in 1901, we finally get a chance to play. Now, you may not know this, but there's a lot of player coaches back then. We won our first game in 1901. First two years, we went winless, went uh, 0-2, and then 0-4 in 1896. Did not fill the team again until 1901. And State goes 2-2-1 two, two, that year. L.B. Harvey was your coach. We opened the season with a tie against Christian Brothers. We beat Ole Miss. We beat the Meridian Athletic Association. You take that, huh? We lose at Tulane, and we lose at Alabama, 45 nothing. Wentz. That game was played on the quad. So the first ball game between State and Ole Miss, and at the time you know, we were A&M, the Mississippi A&M Aggies, was delayed about 40 minutes. A former Ole Miss football player by the name of Billy Green. Now, it depends on which version of the events that you believe, but some say he flunked out of school at Ole Miss. Others say he quit and enrolled at Mississippi State. But he was a player on the Mississippi A&M Aggie football team. And before the game, the coaches at Ole Miss objected to him playing, said that it would be an unfair advantage state. Because of the fact that he played at Ole Miss, he would know the signals and the formations and the plays and things like that. And as a result, they didn't want him to play. So he argued and fought and cried and everything else in uh, your typical rivalry fashion. And so the decision was made that Billy wouldn't play. Probably wasn't fair to him. Probably wasn't fair to Mississippi State. But he didn't play. And your Aggies went on to win the game 17 to nothing despite the fact that Billy Green didn't play. So even though Ole Miss wanted to dictate terms to Mississippi State and say who could and could not play in the ball game against their prestigious football team that was, what, a ripe eight years of age, we won the game. In 1905, Mississippi State and Ole Miss played in Jackson for the very first time. Now, according to accounts, and I have a copy of, in Stark Villains, of a letter to the editor written by a student with the initials P.A.P., PAP. And I felt that it was important to preserve that document for posterity's sake. I found a copy of it in the reflector. But according to 
the media accounts, every student at Mississippi State attended the game. And there weren't a lot of students back then, but the cadets took a train to Jackson. And for many of them, it was their very first trip to Jackson. And they went, they did the, you know, the revelry and all that kind of stuff, and, and they even went and played uh, at the governor's mansion. And what's interesting about that year is prior to the season, Ole Miss lost their football coach. Maybe you're familiar with that. They did. And so as a result, they didn't get a lot of good practice time in together. There weren't a lot of great things going on. And in the infancy of the Ole Miss program, they simply weren't very good. In the first several years of the Ole Miss football program, you know, they were just kind of middle of the road. They opened up strong, went 4-1, and 6-1, and one, then 2-1, and one, then 1-2, one 1-1, and 3-4, 0-3 one, one, oh in 1900. That was uh, William Shibley, was the coach then. Then 2-4. and four. Daniel Martin was the coach in 1901. He ultimately left Ole Miss to be the athletic director and football coach at Mississippi State. How about that? There's a lot of, you know, talk in the wind about another SEC school taking a sitting Ole Miss football coach. Well, we did it first. 1902, MS Harvey was the coach. They went 4-3 and three, and then 2-1-1 in 03 and 4-3 and in 1904. But in 1905, Thomas Hammond, or excuse me, excuse me, MS Harvey left Ole Miss, and so they had no coach in 1905. What's interesting is, uh, you know, MS Harvey started at Alabama, went to Auburn, then to Ole Miss, and then he was out of football. And from there, the trail about him kind of goes cold. He was a former Auburn football player, so he left Alabama for his alma mater, and then ultimately ended up at Ole Miss, posting a career record of eight seven and three. But in 1905. We go down to Jackson to play. That particular year for Ole Miss, tough, to say the least. Not much coaching, not much practicing. They went 0-2 that year, including the loss to Mississippi State. That particular game, we had no stands. We played on the fairgrounds, again, for the first time. And the game got a little contentious, shall we say. As State began to get momentum in the ball game, our fans kind of went onto the field and were taunting the Ole Miss players. It got so disruptive, the officials had to stop the game to get our fans back on the side. As the game again began to get away from Ole Miss, their fans came onto the field. Could you imagine that today? That like you're out there on the sidelines with your team, the play didn't go your way, you wander onto the field, confront the offending player. Well, that's what happened in 1905. And then after the game, which State won 11 nothing, and if memory serves me correct, Ole Miss did not score a point in either of their two games that year. Those smart aleck Mississippi A&M cadets somehow, someway, found a coffin at like a Goodwill or a secondhand store and then performed a full military parade funeral down Capitol Street to celebrate the death of the Ole Miss athletic spirit. That's exactly how it was written. And they put the coffin on their shoulders, and they put a bulldog. We had a mascot at the time. They put bully on top of the coffin, and they had a funeral for Ole Miss football. How about that, Hugh Killenberger? How about that? From there, it was back and forth for a while, but then in 1911... Mississippi State wins the game six to nothing. That begins a streak of 13 consecutive wins for the Bulldogs. What's interesting about that, to kind of show the dominance of the Aggie program, 10 of those 13 wins over Ole Miss were shutouts. They didn't score a single point in 10 games. Pretty crazy to think about. And then the two they did, only one of them was, I guess two of them were competitive. One of the games, they scored 14 points in 17. We beat them 41 to 14. They didn't score again until 1922. We win that game 1913, and then in 23, we win 13 to 6. So 10 shutouts and a streak of 13, our longest winning streak in the rivalry. After the dominance of Mississippi State had, things got uh, really maybe out of pocket. 
you know, beating Mississippi A&M became a bit of an obsession in Oxford. And finally, in 1926, Ole Miss wins a game 7-6. We miss an extra point. They win a game 7-6. The game was in Starkville. The Ole Miss fans and students were so incredibly exuberant. They rushed the field, tore down our goalpost, tried to leave the stadium with them, and a riot broke out. And a riot and a fight that ultimately Mississippi A&M won. And as legend has it, there were a few wooden chairs that had to be sacrificed that day in defense of the honor of the Mississippi A&M Aggies. Now, I want you to visualize here for a second. You know, I'm an old guy. I'm from the 1900s. You know, my parents were born in the 1940s, which means that this could have been their parents. So think about your grandfather or perhaps your great-grandfather attending a college football game and then the visiting team's fans rush the field and tear down the goalposts and try to leave with them. And all of a sudden, a WWE Battle Royal breaks out. An ECW table letter, ladders and chairs match breaks out. And there's your grandfather out there swinging a chair. Hinton Hunter Divine the Third in the head or something, you know, with probably had those bad Bama bangs and a, you know, cheap bourbon and a overly starched sports coat. So after the rivalry riot, the school administrators got together and said, hey, we got to do something to cool tensions between the two schools. Because again, it's only been toxic era as of late. Right, Hugh? They decided to put this trophy together. If we had a trophy, something we could bring home with us, then we wouldn't need to beat each other up. So that's when the golden egg was introduced. It was no longer the series between A&M and Ole Miss. It was now the battle for the golden egg. And there are a lot of people out there that uh, don't understand, you know, the golden egg. The battle for the golden egg is the proper nomenclature. It's not the egg bowl. The egg bowl is a creation of the Clarion Ledger because State and Ole Miss had been so putrid, wouldn't make in bowl games, they thought, hey, let's call it the egg bowl. Because, again, the Clarion Ledger didn't think we had anything to celebrate. But after the golden egg was introduced, the momentum and the rivalry changed. From 1926 to 1935, State did not win a game. Ole Miss won them all. There was one tie in 1929-77. But we put the golden egg in, and all of a sudden, we lose some momentum. State wins again in 36 and 37. Ole Miss gets back in 38. Then we win the next four. Now, what's interesting about this little streak here, in 1936, we win 26-6. to six. That was, again, that snapped Ole Miss's streak. That began a nice streak of success for Mississippi State. We win 6-7 of seven during that time frame. Now, I want to call you to a uh, – and we're going to talk some Alan McKean stuff in the next segment of the show. But – State at this point was not considered to be a very serious college football program. We didn't get a lot of uh, notoriety. We also had very little traction politically within the state of Mississippi. Now, these days, there weren't a lot of bowl games either. That's important to understand. And even when we were bowl eligible, we had this reputation of not traveling well. And some of that was well earned. You know, we had some, some players and coaches that came from, you know, farming families, and so it was difficult for our fans to attend games, didn't always have the resources. That's one of the reasons things, I guess, have been so contentious. You had the haves and the have-nots, and the haves were always talking down the have-nots, as if somehow that financial independence is, uh, you know, a mark of a person's, you know, self-esteem or whatever. Uh, but the reality of it is, is we, you know, we were part of the same conference, but uh, even when we, we did have good years, we did not get the opportunity to go and play in the postseason. You look back at 1917, State is a 6-1 and one team. When we sit home, there was just nothing. There was nowhere to go. So we get into the 30s, and um, this 1936 game is important for a couple reasons why. It's the first year that Mississippi State actually was bowl eligible, but Major Raf Sassy was our coach. 
Now, Sassy was at Army, got out of coaching, and then was hired to come to Mississippi State in 35. His very first year, and Sassy was the guy that first said we should actually have an official Bulldog, not just a borrowed Bulldog. He made that an important part of things. At this point, we were the Maroons. We'd had a Bulldog for years, but now it was official. But Sassy's first year at State, we go 8-3. and 8-3, and, and then nothing happened. And part of that is because of the fact the Mississippi State Legislature was filled with Ole Miss-educated officials that essentially guaranteed, as part of the bowl bid process, that they would ensure the tickets were bought. Well, State had no such cooperation from the state legislature. We just didn't have a presence there. And so bowls, especially back then, bowls are all about money now, but they certainly were back then. And it was about ticket sales. It wasn't about on-the-field production. There were times that winning teams sat home to get a maybe a mediocre team just to sell tickets. And that's what happened a lot of times with Ole Miss. And Ole Miss had some good teams, but they also had the backing of the state legislature guaranteeing ticket sales. But in 1936, state goes 7-3-1, and we, we make it to the Orange Bowl. Pretty impressive deal. We lose to Decanes 13-12. But it was a good season for us. And for the first time, we were celebrated. In 1937, it's a very interesting year. State goes 5-4-1. and one. Sassy ultimately had to resign his post. They labeled it a nervous breakdown. I have learned through my own research that it was actually more about alcoholism and that alcoholism was a part of his life. He was a former military guy. He was a celebrated war hero. That alcoholism was part of the reason that he lost his job at Army. And ultimately, it cost him here. It was after the LSU game that he decided that he would retire. And then State went on a two-game winning streak. And they won the Egg Bowl in Oxford 9-7. to And the players, as they left the field, media accounts share, they said that one was for Sass. Ralph Sassy. The end of the year, 5-4-1, and one, we make the bowl game despite the fact that we uh, – we're a better team the year before. It's kind of funny how that all works, right? You know, 30, it's like in 37, you know, we uh, get to go to a bowl game too. But it's, uh, you know, look, looking at these list of seasons, it's always so interesting to me how you'll, you'll have big years one year and then go nowhere. And um, other years, you're just kind of mediocre and it works out. You know, it's just funny how it all works. But Sassy was there just three years at Mississippi State. And according to accounts, he was uh, much beloved by our students. Three years at Army, he was 25-5-2. His final season was 1932 and then came aboard at Mississippi State in 1935. Was the AD and the coach. Stepped down from his AD responsibilities in his final season. And, um, you know, again, things kind of happened. I'm going to read you a, uh, a bit of a segment here from a newspaper article about Sassy. It is from a no, the Sarasota Herald Tribune. This is a syndicated story, I think, through the Associated Press. And yes, it was. November 11th, 1937. Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Sassy, who built up a highly rated football team at Mississippi State College, was confined to his home, suffering from a nervous breakdown. Acting on the advice of his physician, Dr. J.W. Eckford, Colonel Sassy resigned yesterday his head coach at State College, but retained his position as head of the ROTC. Sassy was advised that his condition would not permit him to resume coaching this season, but Dr. Eckford, Eckford said the famous Army man might be sufficiently improved to resume his other duties later. The football squad and the college student body were temporarily stunned by the sudden collapse of their coach. Sassy was showered today with testimonials of sympathy and well wishes for his speedy recovery. So it was national news. It was not an insignificant thing, in the least. And those are the things that I think about, you know, about how alcohol is so cunning, baffling, powerful. And of course, State went on to beat Sewanee the next week, 12 nothing, and of course, Ole Miss, 9-7. Uh, Sassy was replaced by Spike Nelson. Now, Spike Nelson went 4-6 and six as a coach. There was nothing very remarkable about Coach Nelson as a football coach uh, at Mississippi State. Four and eight, one and four in the SEC. Uh, beat Howard, Florida, Louisiana Tech, and Duquesne's, and then uh, you know lost to Ole Miss in the Egg Bowl. What's interesting 
probably the most notable thing about Spike Nelson's long season at Mississippi State is he changed the school colors. I don't know if you were aware of that. We've always been maroon and white, but he elected to change our colors to cardinal and gold. And apparently this was something that was done kind of unbeknownst to some of the people in the administration. You kind of wonder how that happens, you know. But they did. We wore cardinal and gold uniforms in 1938. The fans were furious. The alums were furious. And Nelson, of course, was the guy that was a very hard-handed coach. Players didn't like him. He was fired at season's end. And I'm told, you know, from some people that have done a little more research on this than me, that um, the cardinal and gold uniforms was kind of the, the impetus it's like this guy did this kind of without our knowledge and went against our traditions. And so he's done. We can't trust this guy. The players don't like him. Former players didn't like him. Students didn't like him. So he was an extremely unpopular coach, who so he's gone after just one season. Once we get back from uh, the top ten list, we're going to kind of pick it up from there. But it's interesting to go back and look at the list of egg balls and how things, you know, prior to Alan McKean being hired, we're going to speak extensively about him, how many coaches had success against Ole Miss and how many didn't. You know, again, the first part of this rivalry, for many respects, was kind of owned by Mississippi State. There was a shift in the recruiting focus between State and Ole Miss that I think really changed things. We're going to address that after today's top ten list which is brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. Blair Chandler, a longtime friend of mine, a Blair guy that gets things done. There is no doubt about Blair Chandler being a guy that's a go-getter. If you need mortgage help, and maybe you do and don't even know it, maybe you have some resources available to you that you're unavailable, un, un, uh, excuse me, unaware of. Goodness, if I can spit it out. Blair can put up a plan together to help you navigate through your financial issues. Whether you're looking to consolidate some debt, get some cash out, or perhaps buy a home for the first time. Maybe you need a second mortgage. Blair is an expert in every bit of that. Check him out at CloseWithBlair.com, C-L-O-S-E, with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Or I tell you what, just between us girls here, let me give you his personal cell number, 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. Reach out to Blair. And let him know you heard about him on the barnyard, and he will pay for your appraisal. It's about a $500 value. There's a lot of people that want your business. Blair puts his money where his mouth is. This is the guy that gets things done. Top 1% close ratio in the country. Works your fairway mortgage. Recently voted number one in customer satisfaction for mortgage loan origination. 21 years of experience. Coffee's for closers. Blair drinks a lot of it. Again, that's closeofblair.com. All right, The Rock of Mississippi today. This is not the, as easy a list as you might think, because we're doing real rock stuff, right? Even though I did work in a jam band, it'll make uh, B.J. Cummings and Blair both happy. But I give respect where respect is due. Now, a couple of these bands I have a personal connection to. I have a friend that was in two of these bands. I liked them a lot. And there is a member of one of these bands that um, I liked and respected, and we lost them. And uh, I'm going to talk about that shortly. But number 10 is a band from the early 2000s that was really on their way. It's a band called Atom Ship. A-T-O-M, Ship, Atom Ship. We're going to go with the song Pencil Fight from Atom Ship as our number 10 song on the Rock of Mississippi. Great tune. The guitar is amazing. Joy's vocals, incredible. Number nine, a more, more modern band, they actually uh, perform their own stuff, and then they do like a set of Black Sabbath stuff. So they're true to the rock. From the Mississippi Gulf Coast, it's Magnolia Bayou, and we're going to go with the song When a Good Dog Goes Bad. I really like these guys a lot. I need to get out and go to a show and go support those guys. We talked about them on the show now for a couple of years, but um, if you're looking for new rock in Mississippi, Magnolia Bayou may be for you. And number eight. Joey Culver was a singer in Adam Ship. He was also the singer in a band called Papercut Massacre that I absolutely loved. They had a song on Sirius XM Octane called Lose My Life. You know, the chorus is Lose This Life. And um, 
I really thought these guys were going somewhere. I saw them uh, with Scroo- at Scrooge in the Coast that year with Hellstorm and Papa Roach and Shine Down. It was an amazing show. And Joey gets up on stage and he goes, you know, he's from the Gulf Coast. He goes, I spent my whole life dreaming of playing in this building. And I remember thinking to myself then as a Mississippi kid, you know, how cool that was to grow up and you go see shows there and you've seen Molly Crew and Rat and Guns N' Roses and everybody. And then one day you're on that same stage, play it in front of a near capacity crowd. What a thrill that had to be for him. And what you don't know about Joey Culver is he eventually put a band together called My Hero the Villain. I thought that was an incredible band name, but it also led me down the thought process that many of my heroes have been the villains. Yeah, I think the villains in writing and in movies are typically the more interesting characters. And so I kind of understood what Joey was talking about. And ultimately, that thought process of my hero, the villain, led me to write Stark Villains. I was going to write the book, but that's what ultimately inspired me to come up with the title of Stark Villains. My heroes have been the villains, the people that have upset the apple cart, that have changed the natural order of things. And that's what happened when Mississippi State was founded and established, is that we challenged the natural order here in the state of Mississippi. We provided a place for everybody in Mississippi to go to college. It wasn't this elitist institution. And so because of Joey and his genius, Stark Villains became a real thing. And so I tip my cap to Joey and his creative genius for inspiring me to what I think now is a great title. And I also on the on the copyright and the patent on the term Stark Villain. We lost Joey New Year's Eve 2020. Depends on who you talk to, you know, um, and I'm not going to sit here and, you know, trash a man's legacy or anything like that because I don't know all the details. I just know that we lost him too soon. An incredibly talented vocalist, an incredibly talented songwriter, and my friend Brian Jones, um, we're doing some work together, but uh, Brian was part of Adam Ship and Papercut Massacre with Joey, and we have talked extensively about him at times. And you know, Brian still plays, and matter of fact, you can find him around just about anywhere. He plays around Central Mississippi a lot, a lot of these uh, acoustic shows for restaurants and things like that. And I've asked him, I said, man, do you ever think about playing some of those songs you and Joey wrote together live again? And there's some of them he does, and, and there's some of them I think it's a little more personal. Maybe you can't do it. But um, today on this show, I wanted to make sure that, you know, tip of the cap to my buddy Brian, but also, too, that let's remember Joey Culver. I never got a chance to meet the man, but I have many friends that considered him a friend, and I've had multiple of them people said, dude, you and Joey would have got along so great. And because I'm in recovery, it makes me wish that, we would have gotten to know each other before now. You know, it's one of those things that you, you wish somehow, some way, not to be narcissistic, but you think, you know what? You know, maybe I could have been there somehow, some way. But uh, tip of the cap to Joey Culver and everybody that loved him and his music. And uh, I know that he was part of the Mississippi Gulf Coast you know, music scene, you know, basically his entire life from a teenager until his death. And so tip of the cap. To all of you that supported Joey and bought a ticket, went out and saw his show. All right, number seven, a band that many of you absolutely love. It's not really my thing, but I respect their sound. It's the band called The Weeks. And right now, some of you are saying, yeah, man, I was hoping The Weeks would make the list. These guys are good, man. Again, I'm more of a straight-ahead rock and roll guy, and these guys are very alt. They're not really alt-rock. They're just kind of alternative. But the song Talk Like That, I think it, it just kind of scratches you where you itch, man. That's your number seven song today, The Weeks, Talk Like That. Number six, and for my friends BJ and Blair, it's the North Mississippi All-Stars. Now, this is one of these bands, too. It's not really my thing, but it's good driving music. You can just kind of put on an album, and they're so incredibly talented. Even if you don't know the songs, they're very entertaining and engaging. To me, the one that stands out to me is Stomp my, Stomping My Foot for the North Mississippi All-Stars. And again, they have a huge following. I know in the the jam band community, there are a lot of people that when you talk about who are the better jam bands, you know, their name comes up, you know, shortly after Widespread Panic and some of those others. Huge following. Number five, I never know if these guys are together or not. It's like something will show up on social media and say, hey, there's a show, and then, oh, they canceled the show, oh, they did a surprise show. They're not talking anymore. They're recording a new album. 
It's Bishop Gunn from Natchez, Mississippi. I love both albums. I do. But we're going to honor the first big single. It is a very haunting song that tells an incredible story, and it's the song Alabama. If you're unfamiliar with that, get familiar with it. I don't care what music you listen to. I don't care if you're a gospel person, a rock person. It's not really a rock song. They're a rock band. This is not a rock song. There's some incredible harmonies on this. Makes you feel like you should be sitting on an old, uh, you know, wooden pew somewhere fashioned by the deacons a generation ago, fanning yourself in a church that uh, doesn't have central air and heat, listening to a choir. It's an incredible song. Number four, a band that many of you don't know, and I think this is probably one of those moments where I'm probably helping you a little bit. There's a band from Biloxi called Wild Fire. These guys rock. I haven't seen them live. This is one of those bands, too. I'm, I'm doing you a solid right here. You put this thing on, you're going to be like, you know what? what I, where have I been? And so I'm going to introduce you with their debut single. It's a song called Villain. It's about being the villain. Wildfire's Villain, the number four song today on today's top ten list. Number three, it's those bad boys from Corinth. It's Saving Abel. Great band from Mississippi. Saw them in Tupelo with, uh, let me think who all was there, Shinedown, Buck Cherry, and somebody else. I can't remember. It was an amazing show. Maybe you were there too. Me and Ani went. It was an amazing time. Got to meet the guys from Shinedown for the first time. Oh, Avenged Sevenfold was there. Yeah, that's right. That's, we, we met the Rev shortly before his death. But we're going to go back to the beginning with them. It's Addicted. And I understand that the original singer has reunited. So if you see Save and Able flash up on your Facebook and say they're playing, it's, uh, I think it's pretty much the original, the original lineup. Maybe save one exception. Number two, even though the lead singer was from Indiana, we claim these fellas as our own. It's Blind Melon. Rogers and those guys from West Point, they are, they're a huge part of Mississippi's history and music. They haven't played in a couple years. I understand they're interested in playing. I would love to have them come play for us. I'd love to see them just one more time. One more time. I'd love it. I'd love to do whatever we could to make that happen. And, yeah, I know Shannon's gone. It's, it's a very unfortunate situation, very sad. But if we could just celebrate Blind Melon one more time. Right here in Mississippi, all of us get together. Knowing this is it, it'd be amazing. But number two on your list is Blind Melon's Tones of Home. I don't know that we've done that when We've done some Blind Melon songs in the past. But Tones of Home is one that uh, maybe sometimes is an underappreciated song in the catalog. We talk about change a lot. Of course, no rain. But Blind Mountain is special to me. I know they're special to many of you. And one of the reasons that I'd love to, if we had them at a show, we just go to a show, it's not about just us seeing them. I think they need to see us. I think that we need to go out there and pack out a venue and say goodbye to Blind Mountain. And many of you, maybe you have long ago, but wouldn't it be amazing to just have one more show, one more chance? Because like, how many times in your life it's like, hey, that's the last time I got to see this band and you, you didn't know it. You never knew it was going to be the last time. But I wish we had one more chance. But number one, it's Three Doors Down. From Escatopa, Mississippi, many of them attended Moss Point High School. Great dudes. Um, had a chance to interact with them a couple times, but I'll tell you, the, uh, these guys make us proud. Still out there selling out venues. Still making great music. We saw them in Brandon at the amphitheater with Seether, Sam Denton and I did, and uh, they were amazing. I did the Three Doors Down top ten list shortly after that, and there was a song that I left off the list. I'm going to rectify that today. The number one song of the Rock of Mississippi top ten list from Three Doors Down is the beautiful and poignant and heartfelt song, Landing in London. Bob Seger is a guest vocalist on that. It is one of the most emotional songs of my lifetime. Absolutely incredible. And when they played it live in Brandon, I'd never heard it live before. And I got chills. And I think about my wife every time I, and I, I've wrote something similar to that before 
um, I think about her. You know, when, I, when I'm traveling and everything else, and it's like you get to that part, all I think about is you. You know, there's so many times I'll be out on the road, you know, stopping at a love's truck stop or whatever, and, you know, I, I could stop. You know, I, I could just stop and get a hotel room. You know, I could, I could shut the trip down. But I know what and who is at the end of the trip. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it'd be easy to stop. But if I'm going to spend the night somewhere, I'd want to do it in my house, laying in my own bed next to my own wife, right? And so that song always, when I'm, when I'm traveling and maybe I think, you know what, this is going to be, this is going to be a long drive home from College Station, Texas, or it's going to be a long drive home from Columbia, South Carolina, or Gainesville, Florida. When I consider maybe, you know what, maybe I'll just shut it down, I'll put that song on. And it reminds me where I'm going and who I'm going to. So maybe that impacts you the same way. But I know this is one of those songs for me, like it's on the soundtrack of my life. It just is. I absolutely love Landing in London. It's a beautiful, beautiful song about love and about being apart from each other. And I've had to deal with that a lot here as of late, but uh, I'm about to rectify every bit of that. So if you have ideas for the top 10 list, reach out and let us know. The best way to do that is hit up Roy on Twitter at Dogmatic67, D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And you can also find our great list on Spotify at Dogmatic67. Roy Samanthi is my friend. And uh, I don't get to hang out with Roy as much as I would like to. Been real busy. But uh, Roy is, uh, we were supposed to go to Judas Priest. I couldn't go. Had a speaking engagement. Got, over, got double booked. Bought the ticket. But uh, hope you all had a good time. I would have loved to have seen uh, Queen Trike. I love them. And Three Doors, excuse me, and uh, Judas Priest. I'd love to see Three Doors down too. They just don't tour together. Yeah, but it is what it is. You know, you got to get out and enjoy fun when you can. And so, uh, those of you that went to the Lander Center in my stead, thank you for representing the Mississippi rock scene. We got to get out and make some shows together, folks. We got to get there and have some fun. Remind us why we work so hard. That's to enjoy life. Get out and enjoy some live music whenever you can. All right, now let's get back to our historical look at the. Mississippi State football program in the rivalry with Ole Miss. This segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. You know Campus Bookmart well. They're a Starkvillian institution. If you haven't been by recently, let me encourage you to go by and check them out. They've completely renovated the bully shop. It's all upstairs now. It's allowed them to expand their selection of Mississippi State merchandise. Everybody on your Christmas list, with rare exception, would benefit from new Mississippi State merch. Matter of fact, I picked up some earlier this week, right? It's that time of year. I want people to open gifts from me and smile. I want people to see, I want to see their eyes dance, right? I like to be a great gift giver. So give people what they want. If you got to get them socks, get them Mississippi State socks. You got to get them shirts, get them Mississippi State shirts. Check them out today. You can visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. And that is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than $50. Excuse me, $75. Excuse me. BSR gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. My mistake. Everybody needs a, a little free shipping this time of year at holidays. And so Campus Bookmart hooking you up with that promo code BSR free shipping all orders over 75 bucks because any order less than 75 bucks absolutely incomplete campusbookmart.net okay if I can get going here it's Tuesday I'm not used to recording on Tuesday forgive me not in recording mode so Alan McKean was our coach and I would venture to say Alan McKean is our greatest coach in school history maybe you're familiar with uh, his tenure But Coach McKean came to Mississippi State after a short run at West Tennessee State. Became our coach in 1939. Had a 78-25-3 record. Only one bowl game. Pretty crazy how they work. But uh, his previous year, he went 10-0 at West Tennessee State, of course, which became Memphis. In 1939, he goes 8-2 at State. And then goes 10-0-1 in 1940, and we won the Orange Bowl over Georgetown. Finished the year ranked ninth in the country. Went undefeated that year. 1941, we go 8-1-1. We beat Alabama, win the Southeastern Conference, and Alabama claims an AFL championship. We beat Alabama that year. 
1942, we go eight and two. So you begin to look at this. The first four years, eight wins or more for Alan McKean. Three top 20 finishes. We did not have a team in 1943 as World War II was raging. In 44, we get back together. We go six and two. In 45, six and three. In 1946, eight and two. That year, we won the egg. Now, what's interesting, and I'll share this little story with you, this is documented in Stark Villains. So if you don't have the book, you should get the book. There are only a few copies left. Um, every time I go in a bookstore, they're telling me it's selling again, so it's great. But Frank Carolla and Skeeter Edwards from Leland, Mississippi, were part of some chicanery, shall we say. Prior to the 46 Egg Bowl, these two young gentlemen took a J-3 Cub airplane. Back in those days, especially in the Mississippi Delta, people flew a lot. You could pick up supplies, you trade with your, your neighbors or whatever, and so people would fly planes. So the J-3 Cub was so small, they had to gas up when they left Leland. And they had to gas up when they got to Oxford so they could make a speedy escape. But prior to them taking flight, they had gone around and bought up some maroon paint. They went to every public restroom in Leland, Mississippi, and they stole toilet paper. And, of course, in those days, it was in squares rather than, than in that rolls. They go to the Ole Miss football stadium, and they pour maroon paint in the bleachers. And then they went over fraternity row, and Skeeter turned the plane sideways. They were afraid somebody would see the numbers on the tail. The Venture X Card from Capital One gives you more of what you love, like premium travel benefits and access to Taylor Swift tickets. Oh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and 10 times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. Plus, get access to Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, presented by Capital One. Maybe I'll see you there. The Venture X Card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. Did you know 77% of women who wear bladder weakness products experience intimate skin irritation? As if having incontinence wasn't stressful enough. But Tenna Intimate Pads have been gynecologist tested and do not cause skin irritation. Gentle on my intimate skin. I need to try Tenna Intimate Pads. Visit TennaSample.com for your free sample. Kind to skin protects like Tenna. It's here. Peloton's best offer of the season. Get up to $300 off accessories when you purchase a Peloton Tread. Choose from accessories like a heart rate monitor, non-slip grip dumbbells, yoga blocks, and more. If you've been looking for a sign to join Peloton, this offer gives you everything you need to get going. Hurry. Peloton's best offer of the season is here, but not for long. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Limited time offer cannot be combined with other offers. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. And they threw those toilet paper sheets out on Fraternity Row at Ole Miss. So they effectively painted the Ole Miss campus maroon and white. They hustled back to Oxford, excuse me, back to Leland. And the next day, Frank's dad was fishing. He had a little Philco radio they listened to ball ball game on. And uh, they could only get the Ole Miss broadcast. And the, the commentator at the time said, hey, ladies, be careful where you sit today. Some kids poured some maroon paint in the bleachers. They kind of recounted the story about how a plane had flown over there. And Frank's dad said he knew exactly who did it. It's the only time they ever talked about it. But he told them they were very fortunate they didn't get in trouble. And so for years and years and years, Frank and Skeeter worried that the FAA may come looking for them or that somebody at Ole Miss would come looking for them. So they made a pact they would never tell anybody. And so one day I'm at a basketball game. My agent comes up to me. And he goes, hey, there's a gentleman here that's got a great story about his uncle. And so Mark Darrowin, uh, I hope I pronounced the last name right. I've met Mark a handful of times. Mark puts me in contact with Frank. Mr. Skeet had already passed away. And so he goes, hey, I don't know if he'll talk to you, but he's got this great story. So I called Mr. Frank, and he didn't want to talk about it. He said he had told the Leland newspaper his story after Skeeter Edwards had passed away. And he, they acted like they didn't believe him. And so he didn't want to deal with the public ridicule or whatever. And I said, Frank, listen. Mississippi State fans need to hear this story. Future Bulldog generations need to have this story documented for posterity's sake. And Frank says, okay, Steve. I think Skeet will forgive me. 
I think I've held up my end of the deal. So Frank Carolla gives me this story, this fascinating story. And I've had so many young people, students that have read Stark Villains that have said that is my favorite story. Turned out that um, one of Frank's best friends was former Bulldog great running back Eagle Motlich, who was from my hometown of Columbia, Mississippi. It's funny how life works. When I wrote Stark Villains, I heard from Eagle's grandson who said, hey, th- could I get in contact with Mr. Frank? And so thankfully, I was able to connect Eagle Motlich's grandson with his best college friend, Frank Carolla. They were able to share some stories, and uh, the young man was able to hear some stories about his grandfather as a college student and as a football player that he'd never known. It's amazing. It's amazing how life works. Sadly, we lost Mr. Frank. Uh, he died earlier this year, or late last year, I, I forget, but uh, Mr. Frank passed away, and I'm so incredibly grateful that we were able to get that story, to get his story. I do not support vandalism of other universities. I want to say that right out of the gate. I'm not going to sit here and tell you you should go do that because you shouldn't. You should never go destroy somebody else's property. But on the back of Stark Villains, there's a blurb, of course, with uh, Jackie Sherrill, Ron Polk, Bob Tyler, and at the end, it's Frank Carolla. And it says, I just didn't like Ole Miss. I don't know how else I can expand on that. <laughs> I just didn't like him. But Ole Miss, I guess, in many respects, got the last laugh. We beat them in 46, and then we didn't beat them again for a long time. But in the middle of all that was Alan McKean. Now, Alan McKean, I was fascinated by this story. I always wondered, why, why in the world did we fire this guy that never had a losing season? Were you aware of that? That Alan McKean never had a losing season at Mississippi State. He went 78-25-3. and three. Well, there was this well-heeled booster at the time by the name of Frank Sanders. He was a textile manufacturer in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, and a former Mississippi State player. I guess still at the time we were State College back then. But Frank felt that Alan McKean's offensive football calling was very antiquated. And the reason that despite the fact that we were winning and not going to bowl games is because we had a very boring style of play. And so Frank led this movement to get Alan McKean fired. Initially, he got very little support. Alan McKean, though, according to reports, was a bit prickly. He was a guy that just wanted to coach the football team. He didn't want to get out and go to fundraisers or uh, go to these dinners for the Alumni Association and things like that. He just didn't want to get out and promote himself. He just was a bit of a socially awkward guy that just wanted to coach football. And so eventually... The Delta Touchdown Club got a little disenfranchised with Coach McKean because they would get the coach from Ole Miss to come. They could get the coach from Tennessee to come. They could get the coach from Memphis to come, Arkansas. But Mississippi State's coach, Alan McKean, wouldn't go. And so eventually, Sanders was able to influence those people. And at that time, the Mississippi Delta kind of ran the state, and they turned against Coach McKean. They put all this pressure on Duty Noble to get rid of Alan McKean despite the fact that he was winning. It's like, yes, we're winning. Yes, we're beating Ole Miss on a regular basis. Yes, we have the trophy, but we could do much more. We could be a better football program. We just need a better coach. And then that last year, 1948, Alan McKean goes 4-4-1. He was a man without a country. All he had was his players. I was able to interview Harper Davis for Alpha Dogs, which is also – very worthy of your time, in my estimation. That was my quarantine project. But Harper Davis told me that you know, Coach McKean never really shared his thoughts about it, but they could tell how much it weighed on him. All these people were trying to get him fired, and ultimately it impacted the on-the-field results. You go 4-4-1, four, and one, and then Johnny Ball beat us 34-7 that year. And at that point, Duty Noble was backed into a corner. The Mississippi State students – were also contacted by Bob Sanders. They began petitions, campus-wide petitions. It was student-led. They signed the petition they put on Duty Noble's desk that said, if Alan McKean returns as our coach next year, we will not attend games. So Sanders had lost the administration. He had lost the donorship. He had lost the students. And all he'd ever done is win. 
had one losing record in the SEC his entire year, entire entire career, and that was in '46 when he went eight and two, and we fired him. We fired Alan McKean, and it crushed him. It absolutely crushed him. Eventually, he went and became the director of the Blue Gray College Football Classic. He was inducted into the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame, and eventually the College Football Hall of Fame. Just before her passing, Coach McKean's wife was in terrible health. She was in a hospital. She was in round-the-clock care. And someone came and told her, Ms. McKean, I want to let you know that your husband, Alan McKean, has been inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. And the next day she died. And as I wrote in Alpha Dogs, that perhaps Ms. McKean felt that bit of good news was best delivered in person. It's a beautiful story. It really is. But how we treated Alan McKean as a fan base is shameful, and it is a mar on the Mississippi State football legacy. We fired the greatest coach in school history because basically a message board poster went out and curried favor with other people and convinced them Hey, winning is not enough at Mississippi State. We're not winning big enough. And I guess one could make the argument, you know, hey, yeah, you had all these winning seasons, but you only get the one bowl game. And a lot of that, again, goes back to that whole political clout. Mississippi State did not have the backing of the state legislature to guarantee ticket sales. And so Duty Noble had to make a very difficult decision. Now, what's interesting about this, Sanders ended up looking like a complete buffoon and every bit of this. The very next year, Slick Morton takes over our, as our coach, Arthur Morton. So we went from having all these great winning seasons, we went winless in 1949. Winless. Winless in 49. 08 and 1. Finished dead last in the SEC. Two years later, we went 4 and 5, 4 and 5. We fired Arthur Morton. We hired Maury Walmouth stayed two years. Eventually went on to Minnesota to win an Apple championship. Darrell Royal was here for two years. He went six and four, six and four. He leaves for Texas, and the rest out there is history. Coach Wade Walker comes in, has uh, one winning season out of five. His last two years, he won just two games. He had two last place finishes and one next to last finish in the SEC. And we hired Paul Davis. And finally, things began to turn around a little bit for a short time. But from 1947 to 1963, Mississippi State did not win a game against the University of Mississippi. And let that be a cautionary tale. We had a guy that was winning. He was defeating Ole Miss regularly. And that wasn't enough. And we got spoiled. And we fired him. And then Ole Miss began to dominate the rivalry. That's the difference in the series, is that segment from 1947 to 1963. Now, one of the reasons that Ole Miss, too, made a jump as a program is because of Johnny Vaught's willingness to recruit World War II veterans. McKean was somewhat reluctant to do that. Harper Davis was one of them. We had a handful. We did. But Ole Miss kind of went all in and got a lot of Mississippi uh, natives that had fought in World War II. These guys had stared down the Nazis and won and so it wasn't a big deal for them to line up on an SEC football field. So you had grown men out there playing against, you know, kids right off the farm. And so as a result, the Ole Miss football program kind of took off and kind of left us behind. It wasn't until Paul Davis and the guys won in 1964, ending the streak. Now, in 1963 – Ole Miss was expected to be an outstanding football team, and we tied them in Starkville. And it was amazing. We tied them 10-10. Nobody could believe it. The next year, in 1964, we went over there and we beat them 20-17. Now, I interviewed Hole Granger years ago about what that moment meant, and he said, you would have thought we'd have won the NFL championship. Now, one of the heroes of the 1963 Liberty Bowl is a guy by Bill McGuire, named Bill McGuire, who was also interviewed as part of Stark Villains. And Coach McGuire, of course, has made a name and a reputation for himself as a great high school coach in uh, Alabama. 
I interviewed him about that 64 win and how shocking it was. Bill McGuire grew up the son of an Ole Miss fan. And like many sons, he had a rebellious streak to him, and so he rooted kind of against his dad, so he picked Mississippi State. And his mom kind of joined ranks with him and pulled for the Bulldogs because she loved her son. And then Bill was on this team in 1964 that finally broke the streak, and he got to ride home with his family after the game with his old Miss dad and his mom. And he said all was right in the world. On that ride home from Tupelo, after we had beaten Ole Miss and broke the streak, I got to be with the two people that loved me the most. And despite the fact that his dad was an Ole Miss fan, he was incredibly proud of his son. And so we, we break the streak and we start feeling good about life again. We think things are headed in the right direction. And again, it doesn't last long. And even that 64 year, we went four and six. You know, previous year, we'd uh, you know, won the Liberty Bowl 16-12 uh, to 12 against NC State. Bill McGuire with a big punt block in there. We ended that year ranked number 11 in the country. But that was, that was the high point for Paul Davis because he went 4-6 and six, and then 4-6 and six, and 2-8. and eight. And then Charlie Shower takes over. Things bottom out again with him, 1-9, 0-8. Oh, and, and finally in 1970, we go 6-5, and five, have a winning season again, and we can recapture the egg. Frank Dowsey and Robert Bell were part of those teams. First two African-American players to ever wear the maroon and white in any sport. There's the reason we have the Bell Dowsing Plaza. Frank Dowsing with a pick in that ball game to put it away. Robert Bell out there absolutely just wreaking havoc on the field. But you win that game. And one of the things, too, that somebody shared this story with me, and it's also documented in Alpha Dogs, is Mississippi State – famous maroon band got invited to the Christmas parade in Greenwood. The Greenwood Christmas parade, and again, the Delta used to run the state, was the biggest thing. It was the biggest parade. It was bigger than the one in Jackson, bigger than the one on the coast. Everybody went. And so since we had been invited, we said, hey, we want to be the featured band. It's us and then Santa Claus. So they agreed. And those smarmy Bulldog band members, the famous maroon bands, always had a real good uh, sense of humor, right? Their marching cadence at the 1970 Christmas parade in Greenwood was 1914. So in between songs, they would march. They would say 1914, 1914. That was the score of the Egg Bowl that year as Mississippi State won the game. So all those Ole Miss families and friends that had to sit out there with their kids waiting to see Santa Claus had to be reminded by the famous maroon band that we won the game. Pretty good stuff. Pretty, pretty good stuff. All right, 1974, you know, we finally win it again. Of course, we won in 70. We didn't win again in 74. A nine and three year, that's the Sun Bowl year with Rocky Falker. It's also the first year that we uh, played the game regularly in Jackson. We, we moved it in, excuse me, we moved it in 73. This was our first win in Jackson, of course, and, and forever and a day. You know, we had not played in Jackson. Goodness, I guess we had played basically on campus, um, you know, since – I guess it was the first meeting in Jackson since 1925. And just so you know, I'm not a proponent of moving the game back to Jackson. But we, we did in 73. We finally get a win there in 74, 31-13. And, like, it was funny, too. You, you read the newspaper accounts. It's, oh, it's State's first win against Ole Miss and Jackson since the 20s. Well, we hadn't played them in Jackson. That's, you know, kind of creative journalism there. But Rocky and the guys win that game. And then, you know, the 80s were kind of a slim time for us. You know, this is when you know, the Egg Bowl became the Egg Bowl. There's so many you know, great stories out there that, of games that we lost. I just don't like to document those. But, uh, but you know, we, look, we went in 70, went in 74, and then, you know, we had the Larry Gillard games. We had to forfeit those in uh, the late 70s and 76 and 77. So the 70s was pretty even for us. But the 80s, we went 3-7. and seven. John Bond won a couple, of course, in 80 and 82, and it seems like the only games anybody wants to talk about are the two Egg Bowls he lost. You know, the famous Dick Pace game, a game that State had won, and there was this dubious pass interference call on a ball that we had intercepted in the end zone. They give him one untimed down, and they score to win the game. And then, of course, there's the blown back game. But JB won a couple of Egg Bowls, too, and nobody wants to talk about those. But uh, we did win those, too. And then we didn't win again until 87. That's the, the, the kind of legend of Eric Underwood there. Eric Underwood, a guy from Alabama, comes over here, was a backup quarterback, we had some injuries that year, and ultimately he led State to victory 30-20 to 20 in a battle for the Golden Egg. 
Things began to change, not just in the rivalry, but with Mississippi State as a program. You know, Larry Templeton became our AD at 87. The game moved back to campus in 1991. And since that time, it has been a very, very even undertaking. You play the game you know, back on campus, of course, there's a true home field advantage. It's remarkable. Jackie wins in 1991, 24 to 9. Huge ball game here. And again, Jackie Sherrill, I guess the best way that I could describe Jackie Sherrill is Jackie Sherrill was the kind of guy to spit in Old Miss's face and then dare them to spit back. He just had that alpha dog mentality. He just simply didn't care. And, it, and throughout his career, that's kind of how it was. When he was at Pitt, he got under Joe Paterno's skin. When he was at A&M, he got under everybody at Texas skin. He comes to Mississippi State, gets under Old Miss's skin, so much to the point that they hired private detectives to go follow our coaches around on a recruiting trail. It was crazy. Part of this NCAA uh, farce of an investigation uh, to run Jackie Sherrill out of college football. But Jackie had some big wins. Of course, you know, you win in 93, 94. You know, he, start, he starts out his career there. It really just kind of shifts the focus and momentum of the rivalry in favor of Mississippi State. One of the ones that's probably the most important one is 1998. Mississippi State wins the SEC West at Vault hemingway Stadium. That was a turning point in the rivalry. That's when a lot of people got motivated and said, something has to be done about Jackie Sherrill. Because now these rednecks down the road are playing for an SEC championship. We win that game 28-6. to Romero Miller did not play. Great quarterback at Ole Miss. Didn't play. He was injured. We win the game. Tim Nelson with a big pick six, kind of as the dagger late in the ball game. But I've said many times that our players and our fans got to celebrate an SEC West title at Vault hemingway Stadium. They got to parade around that stadium with the golden egg in tow, knowing they were going to Atlanta. And until Ole Miss is able to return that favor, there's really not much for us to talk about, right? Matter of fact, I offered that quote to Rick Cleveland years ago as he was writing an article about the rivalry, and it made the clarion ledger. How about that? 1999, of course, that's the uh, year of the comeback. Of course, huge game. That's the kick and the pick, right? And I guess you could say the kick, the pick, and the kick. State's trailing this ball game 20 to 6, battles back, and then Scott Westerfield, game winning kick to win the game after Eugene Clinton uh, makes a big interception there. Again, Romero Miller played in this game. David Cutcliffe makes the decision to go for it rather than play for overtime. Miller throws an ill advised pass. Robert Bean deflects it, it bounces off his leg. Eugene Clinton returns it down. You kick field goal, and State wins the game. One of the more dramatic battle for the Golden Eggs in the history of the series. Huge, huge year for Mississippi State. We end the year uh, top 20. Uh, 2001, that was a game, too. That's when the, kind of the beginning of the end of the Jackie Sherrill era here. Of course, it, it kind of limped along for two years. But 2001, Mississippi State was preseason top 15 in, in uh, most people's estimations and projected to be a very good team and challenge for the West. Maybe nobody more exuberant about that possibility than myself. But, of course, these are the Eli Manning years. State wins that game 36-28. Jolie Dunn told me after a ball game prior to this one, talking about the Egg Bowl, that you had to get in Eli Manning's face. You had to make him uncomfortable. And another staffer who shall remain nameless said, we're going to hit him on the first play of the game, even if it costs us 15 yards. We're going to go out there and take the fight to him. And, of course, Eli has a terrible game, uh, throws three picks. Corey Banks, your hero, a couple big picks in the game. State wins 36-28. Really one of the only highlights of the year. We were a terrible team that year. Had all these transfers in from Arizona Western. Uh, they didn't mesh well. The kind of cancers in the locker room. It just didn't work out. And this was kind of the beginning of the end of the Jackie Sherrill era. 2005, of course, we get the – you know, big win for Sylvester Croom there. But I would say the biggest Egg Bowl win of the Croom era was in 2007. I think we'd all agree. Ed Orsron, Ole Miss up 14-0. They get out in their midfield. They're going to go you know, go for it on fourth down to put the game away rather than punt. Wesley Carroll and the Bulldog offense had done absolutely nothing that day. And it was Brandon Cooper. Brandon Cooper, number 93. Truly the only highlight of his career. 
the only notable play that he made is he takes Michael Orr into the Ole Miss backfield and then hits the law firm, and they stack it up. Dominic Douglas, transfer from Hines Community College, comes in and cleans up the play. Turnover on downs. All of a sudden, State employs a short passing game. You start getting out there to Anthony Dixon in space. State goes down and scores, comes back again, scores. And then Adam Carlson, Adam's shining moment, a guy that was up and down throughout his career. I believe it was a 49-yard field goal he makes to win the game. So State comes from 14 down to win 17-14. And even though we had a pick that had some Ole Miss guys with bad bangs waving goodbye to our fans on television, we still came back and won the game. Of course, Derek Pegues' big punt return, that was the big moment too. Once once he got loose, you just kind of felt like we were going to win the game. And shortly after that, we had the many happy returns, signs around the State. That was kind of the genesis of that. One of Sylvester Croom's biggest wins. Of course, not as big as beating Alabama, but anytime you beat Ole Miss, it's a big deal. 2009's another big one, Dan Mullen's first Egg Bowl. You may recall that Houston Nutt said some things in the media that week about how Ole Miss, was, things were getting strong, they were recruiting at a high level, and that they were the program in Mississippi on the rise. Well, Dan Mullen took that personally, as well he should. His first year there, we should have been in a bowl game. If we had challenged to play against Houston, where they, they called Tyson Lee for uh, illegal forward pass, you win that game. You make a tackle on special teams against LSU, you win that game. You had a losing record. But, however, after this win over Ole Miss, they were pushing towards the Capital One Bowl. And Jevin Sneed, God rest his soul, just didn't have a great game. And uh, Corey Broomfield, you know, kind of showed him up there late, you know, with the, uh, the pick six there. But after the game is over, Dan Mullen's down there. And for some reason, we had a microphone on the field. It's like, how does that happen? Like, all of a sudden, the game is over and everybody's celebrating. And somebody just hands a microphone to Dan Mullen. And he goes, I'll tell you one thing. There is one program on the rise here in Mississippi, and it's right here at Mississippi State. You want to talk about an endearing moment? And Dan Mullen's a man of many flaws. That moment right there, every Mississippi State fan, got behind Dan Mullen. Even if you were like, I don't know if this is the guy will it work here. I think Urban Meyer is more the genius of this offense. When he did that, when he addressed the crowd at Davis Wade Stadium, everybody was on board. You know, we had a losing season, but you know we had the egg. And you thought, you know what? This guy is going to turn things around. And, in fact, he did. Dan beat him the next three times. The next three times. It was incredible. The last one, of course, uh, 2011, when that game 31-3 in the mist and rain, that's when we ran the Ralph Coast offense. Ole Miss gets us in 12, and ultimately that game was vacated. Cheaters. And in 2013, that's the Dak Prescott game, right? That's when Dak didn't play. Dak's mom had died, and Dak hurt his shoulder out of Texas A&M. Didn't play against Alabama, didn't play against Arkansas. Damian Williams starts the game. Dak comes in in the fourth quarter brings us back. We win the game in overtime on a Dak Prescott rushing touchdown. The big moment, of course, though, Nico Whitley stripping Bo Wallace as he is running into the end zone for a touchdown. Jamerson Love recovers it. Bulldogs recover. Ball game is over. 17 to 10 winners. We had those bad uniforms, too, those maroon jerseys with the gold numerals. 2014, the year we – number one, and this game, you could make an argument, this may have kept us out of the playoffs. I, don't, I think Ohio State was going to pass us either way. But we go up there and lose. Terrible game. Dag didn't have a good game. I didn't think Dan coached a good game. We didn't tackle well. Will Redmond, of course, misses Jaywin Walton. Had him backed up there on a long third, long play. Ends up going like 92 yards for a touchdown. Jeff Collins just could not figure things out in this game. And ultimately, that game was vacated too. In 2016, State gets the trophy back. Nick Fitzgerald, of course runs all over them, sets a school record for, for rushing, 55-20. And that started, of course, the, uh, the stack, signs, things like that, 55-20, right? A lot of fun. How do you get to Jackson? Well, you take 55-20, to 20, you know. Uh, it's a lot of fun. 2018, State goes up there, wins the game. We end up having to vacate this game too, right? Uh, that was a game too. That's the, the game of the fight. That's when – and the, and the officials, to show just how incredibly inept – the officials were. They couldn't even review a fight and figure out who hit who. A.J. Brown, Jonathan Abram, both should have been ejected from the game. You all saw it, right? They should have been ejected. 
And I can't remember which one of those kids in Bassfield, that was like, uh, I think it was A.J. Moore, he didn't even play in the game. And he got ejected because the officials were so incredibly inept. I mean, you there's a fight, you review it, and you still get it wrong? What does that say about SEC officiating? And the fight, again, I know a lot of people got fired up about that, but, you know, we don't really want that. We've had a few fights over the years on the field. But uh, this one, of course, because the the clock had run out, the play was negated because A.J. Brown made a great play. And, um, you know, then the, then the fisticuffs ensue. And then the touchdown comes off the board. State wins 35-3. to It's a big ball game. And this is the game, too, if you recall. Joe Moorhead and those guys are walking off the field, and he gets into it, Ross Bjork. You know, the previous year, of course, Ole Miss had planted their flag. That's the year that they broke Nick Fitzgerald's leg. And they planted a flag on our field. So we go back, and Jeffrey Simmons and those guys go back and repay the favor. There's all these Ole Miss officials down there. It's like it was okay when they did it, but we're not going to do it at their place. And uh, Ross Bjork and Joe Moorhead get into it. And this is when Joe is walking off the field, and, and I, think it was, uh, I think it was Robbie – who was with, uh, I guess he was with CBI at the time. Uh, but Robbie had video of Joe Moorhead telling John Cohen, he goes, I'm out here trying to calm the situation down, and I got their AD out here popping off. And it was kind of like that Dan Mullen moment. It's kind of like, you know what, this guy, this is our coach. This is our coach. Yeah, it, it was a good year for us. should have been a great year. But we had a great result in the final ball game and dominated an Ole Miss offense that was really good. Held him to three points, and if I'm not mistaken, less than 200 yards of offense. I remember Bob Shoup looked at the box scores. Are you guys kidding me? Yeah. We dominated the game in all facets, and then we won the postgame festivities as well. 2019, of course, that's the, uh, the kick and the piss, right? Or the piss and the kick. Mississippi State should have won that game handily. Absolutely should have. And I give Matt Corral a lot of credit. Matt Corral was on the trash heap of Ole Miss football before this moment. I mean, honestly, let's think about it. You know, John Rice Pumley was the future. John Rice had done a great job. He's a very competitive kid. His dad's from Columbia, comes from a great family. He was perfect for the Rich Rod offense. Matt Corral was not going to play at Ole Miss. He wasn't. But State had a good plan to kind of curtail and contain John Rice Plumley. And you get up 14 nothing, and you're driving down, got a chance to put the thing away, and we fumble the football. But John Rice brings him back, and it's a ball game. But Matt Corral, we, we kind of fell apart here. But Matt Corral made a huge play on that fourth down to keep the chains moving. They go down and, of course, score the touchdown. And then you have Elijah Moore do the, the hiking of the leg. And I was standing on the sidelines when it happened. And as soon as the old Miss ball boy was standing next to me, nice kid. And it was never – it's never like that, like people think. It's never like that. I'm sure he was a student at Ole Miss, but he was like the ball guy that, like, gives the ball to the officials – as soon as we accepted the penalty, they threw the flag. And, of course, officially, I think uh, Harold Jackson, those guys, thought we wanted it on the kick. And they're like, no, no, we want it now. The Ole Miss ball boy turns to me and he goes, well, this ball game's over. Uh, congratulations. And I goes, oh, you never know. And he says he hadn't made a 25-yard field goal all year. I was like, what? He goes, he's going to miss it. I said, are you sure? He said, he's going to miss it. And not only did he just say it, he gathered up all the balls and, and zipped them up. There, he knew there was not going to be any overtime. He zips it up, puts the bag over his shoulder, and shakes my hand before the kick even happens. And, of course, he does ultimately miss the kick. State ends up bowl eligible. And, uh, again, kind of like in the vein of Bob Sanders, you know, we had some fans and donors prior to the Egg Bowl telling people, oh, yeah, we've already agreed to a settlement to fire Jim Moorhead. Before the biggest game of the year, the game that was going to determine if we were going to be bowl eligible and continue to play in the bowl, you give me a break, we're going to make that type of arrangement. It was not, there was no truth to any of that. I don't care what anybody tells you. It's completely false. Completely false. Ridiculous, man. Absolutely ridiculous. All right, next and final segment of the show brought to you by the fine folks at Portico. Now, if you don't know much about Portico, let me encourage you to go check them out. You'll be glad you did. I love the fact that uh, you can live close to campus but also be kind of tucked away in a neighborhood, Right? Because a lot of times nowadays, if you want to live, it's got to be condo living. If you want to be close to campus, you got to be in a condo. Well, not the case. You can go to Portico, and you can have residential living in a nice, developed neighborhood just 1.1 miles away from the Mississippi State campus. Pretty awesome, right? Turn off 82 on a 12, take the first right on Pat Station Road, and boom, there it is. You go through the four-way stop, it's right there to the right. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go all the way up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home. You'll be glad you did. 
Go out there next time and give yourself a self-guided tour. Just kind of ride around and look. And then give Brooks Bryan a call at 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075 to get more information about how you could make Portico your next move. All right, let's talk about recent history here. You know, State has not had any success against Lane Kiffin. These games have been competitive. And maybe they shouldn't have been. I, you know, I really thought last year Ole Miss was a better football team than us. And that's just me being honest about that. I mean, I wanted to win the game. We outgained them. We did. We missed a couple field goals. We dropped four touchdown passes. It really wasn't about them. It was about our own lack of execution. But I'm not going to sit here and be the sour grape guy. Matt Corral won that football game for Ole Miss last year. It guy's com- incredibly competitive. And listen, I, I get the fact that guy made some mistakes early in his career in high school and even when he was at Ole Miss, and you hear all that stuff. But yeah, I think he grew up a lot. You know, and listen, I don't know what all he did when he was in Oxford, but I know that his decision-making as a quarterback got better the longer that he was there. And Lane Kiffin being hired at Ole Miss is the reason Matt Corral was in the NFL today. I know he's been injured this year and he hadn't played, but, you know, you give credit where credit is due. As soon as Lane Kiffin was hired, I think we all knew that John Rice Plumley's career as a quarterback at Ole Miss was over because Matt Corral just simply was a better fit. And give the kid credit for sticking it out. Matt Corral could have gotten done with that egg bowl and just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to go in the portal and be finished. But he waited it out, and it ultimately turned his career around, and it's kind of turned the rivalry around a little bit too. You know, State had won three of four. Now Ole Miss has won two in a row. You think about that 2020 game, and then that's a game, you know, we, I think about, you know, the Austin Williams fumble that ultimately led to, you know, a touchdown. But, you know, Lane Kiffin and those guys went for it a couple times on fourth down when they shouldn't have. If they kick field goals, this game is really – probably a two-possession game, much of the game. You know, in State, obviously, didn't have the personnel and a lot of players. But, uh, you know, Ole Miss the last two years has been the more talented team. Uh, I I think it's a lot more even now in many respects. But uh, you got to give Ole Miss credit and give Lane Kiffin credit. You know, that's one thing. And I had a friend of mine tell me yesterday, he said, I really hope Lane Kiffin will go to Auburn so I can start liking Lane Kiffin again. He goes, I like Lane. He's funny. I like kind of how irreverent and silly he is, but I just can't like him while he's the old Miss coach. And I, you know, I, I kind of agree with that. And I'll be honest with you, Lane Kiffin has been better than I expected. He absolutely has. And I mentioned this on a show here recently. When Jeff Lebby left, I thought, well, this will expose Lane Kiffin. Absolutely not. They might even be a better team because I don't know that they have the talent this year that they had a year ago. You don't have a guy like Matt Corral, obviously. And so Ole Miss has played well. And, uh, you know, Lane Kiffin's done well. I don't think that last week is maybe indicative of the Ole Miss talent level. I think the distractions of all this Auburn talk has kind of gotten to the Ole Miss players. I think the pressure of all that kind of got to them because they were checked out until that game was ultimately decided. You you forget it was 42-6. to This wasn't like it was a competitive game and then Arkansas came back late and put it away. That game was never in question especially in the second half. And I guess really that, that when they go up 35 to 6 in the uh, right before the half, you know, that huge pick from Jackson Dart ultimately led to another touchdown for Rocket Sanders. But don't think that last week's performance is necessarily going to carry over to this week. There's a lot of pride in that locker room. And, again, Lane Kiffin is a good coach, and there's still all this stuff going on uh, you know, Lane, John Sokoloff comes out yesterday and says, based on what he's heard, that uh, it's pretty much a done deal. You know, it's unofficially a done deal. Now, here's what I will tell you about that. I don't know if that's true or not. I, I don't know. I suspect it could be. I had somebody last night tell me that it is simply a matter of time before Lane Kiffin accepts the job at Auburn. Again, I don't know that that's true. That's just what I was told. I have To be honest with you, I haven't chased this much. I've had a lot going on this week. But the reality of it is, is that um, – if you're State or Ole Miss sometimes, I think we lose sight of the fact that we're State or Ole Miss. And that sounds awful. It does. But it's the reality of a situation. There's a reason that Dan Mullen left. There is a reason that Tommy Tuberville left. And as I transcribed uh, Lane Kiffin's press conference, one of the things he talked about, it was raining. And he kind of made this sarcastic comment. And to be honest with you, I'm not going to sit here and defend Ole Miss people. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to do that. But when he said – I wish we had a facility where it wouldn't let rain in or whatever it was. Why, why, why say that? Why, why say that? 
and and I know we all laughed about you know Tad Smith Coliseum, how it was the only game, the only stadium or only basketball venue where you could have a rain delay. But this is your head coach, the ambassador of your program. It's supposed to be out here telling recruits how wonderful your school is. And he's at a press conference before the biggest rivalry game on your schedule. And he says, I wish we had a facility that wouldn't allow rain in. I, I just – I didn't care for it at all. It, and, and I know we kind of snicker and laugh at Ole Miss. I, I don't know how you repair that. And you say, what, well, Steve, it's just one comment. I think it speaks to a bigger issue. I think maybe he's trying to justify his – interactions official or unofficial with Auburn officials and why hasn't he reassured Ole Miss fans that he's going to stay you know it's like he kind of gave up there and gave the Dan Mullen thing it's like well you know you know we've got things going well and is it well he's what else can I say well I'll tell you what you can say Lance you can say yes I am staying and I'm going to sign the contract extension that Keith Carter's put in front of me we have been here before many times with Dan Mullen right we ought to be pros at it but I, I did not like even the fact that I think you know, beating Ole Miss is, you know, one of the most wonderful things that could ever happen. That comment yesterday was out of bounds, absolutely out of bounds. I don't care what you think about Ole Miss, but for their football coach to get up there and make a negative comment about those facilities in front of the media like that on the SEC network, that is out of bounds, absolutely out of bounds. And I would say the same thing if Dan Mullen had said it. I would say the same thing if Joe Moorhead or Mike Leach says it. You're supposed to be an ambassador for your program, an ambassador for your university, and if you have a concern about that, you air that privately. There are just some things you don't share publicly, and I think maybe that speaks to kind of where Lane Kiffin's head's at right now. Now, you wonder how motivated they're going to be in this ball game. Now, he says, you know, hey, we've got a chance to win three straight Egg Bowls, and that is one of the things we absolutely, absolutely cannot let happen, period. Mike Leach has got to understand we have we got to pull out every wrinkle on offense, on defense, special teams, any gadget plays we have, anything we hadn't shown on tape, we got to throw everything out of the kitchen sink, whatever. They have their own issues. They're trying to keep a coach. They may lose that coach. And can you even only begin to imagine Pine Box 2.0? Those of you that are not old enough to remember, Tommy Tuberville before the 1998 Egg Bowl said that you have to carry me out of Oxford in a Pine Box. And then he took the job at Auburn. And it was kind of widely speculated they'd already come to terms, and then he denies it. I will give Lane Kiffin credit for this. He has not come out and denied it. He also hadn't announced that he was state. But all of a sudden, like yesterday, and thankfully it didn't get a lot of traction, the Paul Feinbaums of the world, and I'll say this for the record, y'all can clip it, I don't care. Paul Feinbaum is an embarrassment to the SEC network and an embarrassment to our profession. I don't care how long you've watched him. I don't care how much you like him. He is not a professional, period. He takes way too much glee and satisfaction and say negative things about Mississippi State that SEC Network is supposed to be for the promotion of the universities. And people, oh, he's a journalist. No, he's not, and he never has been. I don't care how many newspaper columns he wrote, he's never been a journalist, period. And what he's doing now, this caricature of himself to get up there and just you know, be the villain, uh, I would not let him back on my campus. And I thought Mark Keenum did a good job kind of dressing him down when they were on there. But he tried to embarrass Joe Moorhead. He tried to embarrass John Cohen. Uh, that's not what the SEC network was put in place for, period. And you can go back, to about you know, the time when he and Hugh Freeze got into it uh, at SEC Media Days. It's inappropriate. It's inappropriate for him to act that way. That's not his role. And if he wants to do that, he can go take a job with uh, ESPN or you know, the Washington Post or something like that. And the fact that that our, our league is okay with this, you know, putting coaches in the hot box on the SEC network is ridiculous. But I have no idea how this thing plays out. I do know that Hugh Freeze is still in play for the Auburn job, and maybe he is the secondary candidate. I do think Lane Kiffin is the home run. And I'll tell you why. Auburn has got to turn that roster over quickly. Now, they have a significant NIL war chest, significant, in excess of $10 million. Now, I've read some other things, so Ole Miss is doing that, whatever. It, guys, and, and I've simply, well, it's similar. No, it is not similar. Please stop saying that. That's just to make yourself feel better and to look smart, and you're not. It's not similar. Auburn has never, ever, ever, ever had difficulty raising money, period. They simply have more resources than Ole Miss does. Like it or not, that's the reality of it. 
And because they have this war chest, they're going to they're be able to work the portal and turn this roster over very, very quickly. Now, Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss are the ones that came out and called him the portal king, right? Now, some of that, too, is the benefit of signing a bunch of transfers, right? It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean, well, the transfer rankings favored us. Well, when you sign the most transfers, of course it does. But you name him the portal king, and you, you can't deny the fact that they have had some real success in the portal. I mean, look at Jackson Dart. Look at Zach Evans. Those guys have come in and played well. They've been able to kind of assimilate them into the culture, and they've changed the offense. And so if you're John Cohen, you say, hey, I, we've got to win now. We've got to win now. Well, Lane Kiffin makes a lot of sense because he's shown that he knows how to use the NCAA transfer portal. You remember last year he said they lost out on some other guys so they didn't have enough money. Well, Auburn's got the money to do it. And so, again, I think about these little needling comments. You know, we didn't get this player because we didn't have enough NIL money. You guys are not committed to NIL. It's like – and then we're talking about the building, that there's a leak in the roof. I mean, listen, I don't care how well a building's constructed. Sometimes, you know, the world's an imperfect place. But I think when you look at the things that he's doing and things that he's saying and what he's not saying, he's not saying enough to reassure Ole Miss fans. But he's also kind of gigging you a little bit. And speaking of gigging, you know, I've, I've had an Alabama insider, two actually, and uh, tell me that Lane Kiffin will never be a candidate for a job at Alabama. Like if people say, oh, he's holding out for Alabama to replace Saban. I'm told it was a very messy breakup and that, no, he would not be a candidate. And I'm sure he knows this. If that's true, I'm sure he is aware of that. So what better way to kind of needle Alabama than to go to Auburn? And then you can deal with it 365 days a year. So you got the guy that knows how to work the portal, a guy that understands how to use NIL, a guy that supports NIL, and a guy that would win the press conference and probably lob some shots at Alabama and then galvanize your fan base and then also have an opportunity to beat Alabama, right? And we hadn't done it at Ole Miss. They've been right there. And all of a sudden, you get a little step up in talent at Auburn. You probably could do that. I think Auburn would. I think they would be very happy with Lane Kiffin. Not to mention, you know, our folks would be very grateful to John Cohen for taking him away from Ole Miss. You know, he stays in the league, and then you kind of wonder what Ole Miss would do. But uh, again, I know I've got a lot of beef with Ole Miss people. The last time I'm going to say this, but that was wrong yesterday. That was absolutely wrong to make that public comment about the facility in front of the media like that. That, to me, that's, that's a guy that does not have pride in where his feet are planted. Simple as that. All right, tomorrow I'll be back and we'll preview the Ole Miss Rebels. We'll talk more about Lane Kiffin. And uh, we'll talk about the season that has been in Oxford. And then we'll kind of look at some matchups. And then that'll be it. Next thing you know, the family will be here and it'll be time for Thanksgiving. And listen, I, I share this with you too. Nothing matters more than family, Period. I know sometimes we all get busy building a brand and building a bank account, and we, we forget about the folks that were with us from the very beginning. And I've got some people in my life, when I was starving, they were starving right there next to me. And, uh, and so I'm very appreciative for those people in my life. And sometimes I have been reluctant to take time away from all of the machine that has been created and say thank you and spend time with those people because I remember this when I was a kid. They said that um, the way that a child spells love it's t-i-m-e time give the people that you love your time until next time let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live did you know 77 percent of women who wear bladder weakness products experience intimate skin irritation as if having incontinence wasn't stressful enough but Tenna Intimate Pads have been gynecologist tested and do not cause skin irritation. Gentle on my intimate skin. I need to try Tenna Intimate Pads. Visit TennaSample.com for your free sample. Kind to skin protects like Tenna. Peloton's best offer of the season is here. Get up to $300 off accessories when you purchase a Peloton bike, Bike Plus, or Tread. Choose from a variety of accessories, like our cycling shoes, a heart rate monitor, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. If you've been looking for a sign to join Peloton, this offer gives you everything you need to get going. This limited time offer ends November 28th. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Offer starts November 14th and ends November 28th. Cannot be combined with other offers. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com.